Okay, so we're continuing on with chapter 26 on electric field, and I want to consider uh, continuous charge distribution, such as this uh, rod of length L and charge Q. So it has a charge density lambda is Q over L, uh, and that has units of coulombs per meter. Or you could consider this area of charge. Uh, You've got a charge Q spread over an area A, and the surface tar charge density is eta equals uh, Q over A. That's got units of coulombs per meter squared. So if we want to find the electric field, you have to do an, an integral. And in fact, uh, if we consider this again, rod of uh, length L, charge Q, uh, we can find this, this integral, which is what I'd like to do next. Okay, so once again, we uh, start with a line of charge. We're going to call it positive charge. It has some length L, and the charge density is Q over L, where Q is the total charge of this rod. And we're going to find the electric field at a point that is a distance R away from the center of the rod. So we're looking at a plane that bisects this rod. So let's draw a y-axis. Uh, going along the rod, and consider a little element of the rod dy, and here we'll be at our distance r. And we're going to integrate y from negative l over 2 to plus l over 2. Here's theta, and here's the distance rho, where Pythagoras gives rho squared equals y squared plus r squared, and theta comes from cos theta is r over rho, or r over square root of r, y squared plus r squared. Now by symmetry, the y component up and down of the electric field at r is going to be zero because there's as much charge above uh, y equals zero as below y equals zero. So what we uh, will compute is this der, the r component of the electric field due to a charge dq, where dq is just the charge in the little element dy. So here's our r again. Here is dE, the electric field we're computing, and dQ is dy times that linear charge density. That's dy times Q over L. And we want to find uh, ER, where cosine theta here is adjacent over hypotenuse, dER over dE. So uh, this dER is cos theta times dE, and dE is just found from Coulomb's law. It's uh, whoop. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times dq over rho squared. Rho is the distance from dq. And so now multiplying by cos theta, we have cos theta over 4 pi epsilon naught times dq over rho squared. I'm going to use our previous equation for cos theta. It's r over square root of uh, y squared plus r squared. dq is dy times q over l, and 1 over uh, rho squared is 1 over y squared plus r squared. So pulling out some of the constants, q is a constant, r is a constant, 4 pi epsilon naught, uh, l, and we've got 1 over y squared plus, uh, plus r squared uh, to the power 3 halves times dy. And I'm just going to integrate that now to get the r component of the electric field at r. So here's some constants. We're integrating from negative l over 2 to plus l over 2 of r times dy over y squared plus r squared to the 3 halves. We can look this up in an integral table, which is in the appendix of your book. Uh, keep in mind r is a constant here because we're integrating with respect to y. And so uh, keeping the previous constant from 4, q over 4 pi epsilon not l, we have y divided by r times the square root of y squared plus r squared, and we're integrating from negative l uh, over 2 to positive L over 2. So we just plug in L over 2 uh, to be to be Y here, and then we subtract plugging in negative L over 2 instead of Y. And writing that out, we've got the L's cancel, and we've got 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q divided by R times the square root of L over 2 squared plus R squared. And so there it is written out another way. Uh, as far as the direction of the electric field, if the rod is positive, 
uh, the field points away from the rod. If the rod is negative, the electric field points towards the rod. And what's given by this equation is just the magnitude of the electric field of the rod. And that's why there's this absolute value sign around uh, charge Q. And uh, the next thing to do is to consider what happens if you make L larger and larger. So this is an infinite line of charge. You take away these ends and stretch them out to infinity. And then in this case, now every point has kind of an equal infinite amount of charge above and below. And so uh, by a symmetry argument, the field must point straight away from the line charge at all points. But the way you do it mathematically is this is that same equation from the previous slide. But now instead of Q, uh, Q over R, I've written lambda. And I've pulled out uh, an R squared uh, factor from this, uh, this square root so that what do I have here. Sorry, I've pulled out a uh, L, L factor as well, so I've got L in the bottom. So what this does is as L goes to infinity, um, this part of the 1 plus 4 R squared over L squared, um, the 4 R squared over L squared goes to 0, and so this becomes 1 over squared 1, and so that just becomes 1. So you have the electric field of a line charge is equal to 2 lambda over R uh, times Coulomb's constant. So it decreases uh, with distance, linearly with, with distance. So next, I want to consider a ring of charge. Uh, so if you look at the field right at the very center of the ring, sort of again by symmetry, uh, the field there should be zero. But as you get further away from the ring, along the axis of the ring, which we'll call the z-axis, then the electric field has this form, and you can, you can show that, and it's shown in, the, in an example in the textbook, but I'll just state it. It's Z times Q, the ch total charge of the ring, uh, divided by the Z squared plus R squared to the power of 3 halves, where R is the radius of that ring, and times Coulomb's constant. And now, if you integrate a bunch of rings from 0 out to capital R, you get a disk. Okay. And the electric field of a disk uh, turns out to be um, eta over 2 epsilon naught. Here eta is the uh, charge per unit area. So Q divided by uh, pi r squared. So the, the area of this whole disk. Times 1 minus 1 over square root of uh, 1 plus r squared over z squared. And what you do then is if r goes out to infinity, whoop, then what happens here? Then this becomes, uh, this whole square root becomes infinite, and so you've got 1 minus 1 over infinity, and so that just is 1 over 1 minus 0, so 1. So eta uh, over 2 epsilon naught is the uh, electric field due to an infinite plane. And that actually doesn't have any z dependence in it. Which is kind of interesting. Uh, for a positively charged plane with eta greater than zero, the electric field points away from the plane on both sides of the plane. Uh, if it's a negative infinite plane, then the electric field points towards the plane on both sides of the plane, but it doesn't depend on distance. It's just this constant electric field. And that's kind of what it looks like um, in a perspective view and in an edge view. So this infinite, so it doesn't depend on distance, and it's eta over 2 epsilon naught. Sphere of charge. So sphere of charge, uh, uh, Q and radius R, uh, whether it's a uniformly charged sphere or just a spherical shell, has the exact same electric field outside the sphere as a point charge located at the center of a sphere. It's Q over 4 pi epsilon naught, uh, 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. Okay. And that's, you'll see that that's exactly the same as the electric field of a point charge. The parallel plate capacitor. So a parallel plate capacitor is two uh, plates um, with charge on it, charge plus Q and minus Q, They're equally and oppositely charged. So their total charge is zero, some area A, and they're held at some distance D apart. So they're par parallel. The distance between them is always uh, D. And that's called a capacitor or parallel plate capacitor. Capacitors 
uh, play important roles in many electric circuits, and we're going to talk about them a lot as, as the chapters progress. So inside a parallel plate capacitor, if it's if you take these um, uh, planes to be infinite, then you have a constant electric field on either side pointing away from the plus plate and a constant electric field on either side pointing towards the negative plate. So if you're outside the parallel plate capacitor, these two electric fields cancel and you get zero. If you're inside the parallel plate capacitor, these two fields add and you get double. So uh, instead of uh, eta over two epsilon naught, the electric field inside a capacitor is just eta over epsilon naught. And it always points from the positive towards the negative plate. And if you have uh, eta as being q over a, if you've got q over a um, times epsilon naught, that's the uh, that's the electric field inside the capacitor. And that's in the assumption that the of infinite plates, which means that the size of the plates of the capacitor is much greater than the distance between uh, the plates. Okay, so that's the ideal capacitor. So the field is uniform, always points from the positive to the negative electrode. The ideal capacitor is a good approximation as long as D is much, much smaller than the electrode's size. And the electrode just means these plates. Outside a real capacitor, what happens is near the edges, there's kind of this fringe field that leaks out. And even outside a real capacitor, there's a little bit of electric field pointing towards the negative plate and away from the positive plate. We're going to keep things simple by assuming the plates are always close together, and we're going to just use E equals eta over epsilon naught for the magnitude of the field uh, inside a parallel plate capacitor. So this is a uniform electric field. At every point in space, the electric field is the same magnitude and direction. The easiest way to produce a uniform electric field, as it turns out, is to use a parallel plate capacitor. When you're inside a parallel plate capacitor, this is the situation you have, uniform electric field. So what happens to a charged particle when you place it inside a uniform electric field? Well, uh, here is a little charge Q with mass M, and you place it at a point where there's this electric field E that's been produced by maybe some parallel plate capacitor that you don't see in this diagram. What will happen is there'll be a force on Q in the direction of the electric field, and what that will do uh, is, well, I guess it'll accelerate it. If the charge is negative, then the force will be opposite the electric field. So if this is the only force, then the acceleration by Newton's second law is this force divided by m. So it's q over m times e, where e is the electric field. And if the electric field is, is uniform, then the acceleration is a constant, q e over m, where e is the electric field strength, q is the charge, m is the mass. And here's an interesting application. Uh, it's gel electrophoresis, and you may have done this in your biology labs. But basically, you have a uniform electric field produced by a uh, what's basically a parallel plate capacitor, and you have a gel that contains uh, negatively charged DNA fragments. And the gel exerts a drag force as these things drag along, so all the little fragments of DNA move at a terminal speed that is inversely proportional to their size, which is causing uh, the drag force there. And so you can examine uh, DNA fingerprints in this, in this way. Dipoles. So how do dipoles move in an electric field? So here we have a uniform electric field and a dipole, which has an equal amount of positive and negative charge separated by some distance. And so the force on the positive side uh, is in the direction of the electric field. The force on the negative side is opposite that direction, and they'll cancel. So the net force on the dipole is zero. However, if you look at the torques, this is uh, the force on the positive end produces a clockwise torque. The force on the negative end also produces a clockwise torque, and so there is a net torque which will cause the dipole to rotate. And it'll rotate 
until it is aligned with the electric field and then the torque goes to zero. This is a dipole that's in equilibrium with the electric field. And the positive end of the dipole ends up uh, in the direction of the electric field. So here is a sample of dipoles that's uh, placed in an external electric field. What will happen is all these dipoles will uh, tw twist around and align with the electric field. If this is water or something and these were free to rotate, they would rotate so the pluses would be uh, in the direction of the electric field and the negatives would be the opposite direction. You can compute the torque on a di dipole uh, with this equation. It's going to be uh, 2 times the, the torque from D, the distance lever arm, times uh, the force. And we put the 2 comes from the fact that we've got the same torque coming from the negative and the positive sides. So the lever arm is 1 half S sine theta, where S is this uh, uh, length of this dipole. Um, the dipole moment P is S times Q. And here's a Q, which is Q times E is that force. So it ends up being P times E times sine theta, where theta is the angle between the dipole moment and the electric field. So suppose you have a dipole that's in a non-uniform electric field, such as uh, the field from a point charge. What will happen then? Well, the first response will be that the dipole will rotate around so that the plus is in the direction of the electric field. And then once it's aligned, you've got a slightly greater attractive force from the negative side of that dipole than the repulsive force on the net positive side of that dipole. And what happens is that now, now there's a net force which is towards the left. It's attracting the dipole to the positive, test, uh, positive point charge. If you have a negative point charge, then the dipole rotates around the other way. And once again, the attractive force of the positive end is greater than the repulsive force of the negative end. And so this dipole also experiences a net force toward this uh, negative charge. So any charged object will attract little dipoles.